Amen. Will you stand with us, please?
Praise God. Amen. You may be seated. And to First Baptist Tanner, we're glad that you're here, especially those of you who are our guests. If you're visiting with us today for the first time or the first time in a long time, there's a guest welcome card in front of you in the pew, I trust. And uh, if you had filled that out, you can place it in our offering boxes in the back of this room later in the service uh, when we dismiss. Or there's a QR code there that you can register your attendance. If you're tech savvy, you can do it that way as well. But nonetheless, we're just glad that you're here. Thank you so much for coming to join us today at First Baptist Tanner. Uh, I'm, uh, just, it's just exciting to see uh, these young people following the Lord in believers' baptism. What a great way to start our service today. And I have some announcements that I want to share with you. They're in the bulletin. If you'll just take a moment and look at those, if you received a bulletin. So many activities that are coming up. Just a quick reminder, the men's retreat is this weekend, February 10th and 11th. So see Pastor John, if you've not already signed up, there's a sign-up place for you to be a part of that. And it's not too late. We would love to have you uh, join uh, for that uh, men's retreat that's happening this weekend. Parents' Night Out is this weekend, Saturday night from 5 to 9. If you've not yet signed up to either uh, participate, bring your child here, or signed up to volunteer and help with those that will be providing child care, there's a place for you to sign up, register for that as well. See Miss Tammy or Miss Janet if you have questions about that. Our chili cook-off is coming up in a couple of weeks. Just a reminder of that, our WMU meeting this Saturday morning, this Saturday morning at 8.30. Camp to Belong, so an event. We mentioned that last week, but if you would like to participate in helping to put together some material that will be used to make quilts to give to children uh, that have been, uh, that are staying in foster homes, but they've been separated. Brothers in this state, sisters in that state, they're coming together for a camp, and we want as a gift to provide uh, quilts for them just as a keepsake. See Miss Deb Reed if you have questions, but that's this Saturday morning. Ladies, if you'd like to participate in that from 9 until 3, and uh, uh, you don't have to be an expert sewer, but you certainly can come and help and assist in any way. And even guys, that if, you, if you'd like to participate in that, you could. Uh, Deb said if guys will come and help with the sewing, she would come and help with the wheelchair ramp. Wayne Tuberville told her, no, we don't let women because they take over. And uh, so I need to communicate that to Doris. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, you can participate. Contribution statements are available. Uh, if you've not yet picked yours up uh, from this past year, they're out in the foyer, and you can pick those up at the conclusion of our service. And then, of course, our American Heritage Girls have a flag retirement ceremony that's coming up in March if you'd like to have a flag participate in that. So a lot of things going on at First Baptist Center, a busy church, and uh, I'm glad to see so many different ministries that are happening. Guys, wheelchair ramp. Friday morning, 8 o'clock, if you want to participate in that. Uh, it's a wonderful time, not only a fellowship, but it's also a great time of ministry. And you're being a blessing to someone who has that need. So see Wayne Tuberville if you have questions. Or meet here at the church Friday morning at 8 o'clock. Let me lead us in prayer. And let's just continue to worship our Lord. Would you join me please? Heavenly Father, it is so good just to come together as people of faith brothers and sisters in Christ, the family of God, to gather here this morning in this place of worship. And Lord, we pray that you would, first of all, just be blessed by our worship of you. Father, I pray that you would remind us that you are the audience of our worship. And, and Lord, we bow before you to acknowledge you as our Lord. And we're grateful for your blessings in our life. So often, so many things we take for granted. But Lord, today we come with hearts of gratitude just for your blessings. Father, I know there are people in our service today that are hurting. They're grieving over the loss of a loved one. Or they're concerned about the health of someone. Or maybe they have personal issues in their life that they just need to hear a word from you today. To be blessed by the encouragement of someone in this room. Or to be blessed by 
hearing from you. So minister to their needs. I pray, Lord, that the peace that passes all understanding would guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And Father, even though we may go through trials and, and we may go through hardships and we may have burdens in our life, remind us of your promise that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And your mercies are new every morning. So I pray that you just minister to your people today, that you would bless the preaching of your word. May it find a lodging place in our hearts. And even, Father, as I try my best to communicate truth today, I know that I am speaking to the minds of people, but only your Holy Spirit can take your word and put it in their hearts and in my heart. And I pray that you would do that today. In every way, may Jesus be exalted during these moments of our worship. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's lift up Jesus. Will you stand?
On Christ the solid rock we stand. We thank you, Lord God, that we're secure in you. You were stable and our eternity is sealed. Thank you for the love of Jesus Christ that's resurrected us. We pray your blessings over Gary this morning, Lord. Thank you for the words that come from his mouth, come straight from your throne. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, praise team, for leading us in our time of worship. Um, today I want to share with you a message that I've just borrowed the title from our youth, uh, our student ministry attended a uh, retreat a few weeks ago. You saw some of the fruit of that today in our uh, baptism service. Uh, the theme of that was strength to stand. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about a message that actually my youth, my youth pastor many, many years ago, who's now retired from ministry, uh, shared some insight uh, about uh, the text that I want to share with you today. And uh, so I'm, I'm taking what I've learned from him and blessing it and asking the Lord to bless it and share it with you. But we're going to uh, be looking, about, looking at this matter about standing for the Lord. Now, you know that this is the time of year that people are thinking about champions, championships and champions. Um, just a few weeks ago, we had the National College Football Playoff Championship. Next Sunday, we're going to have the Super Bowl, and people are concerned about who's going to be the NFL champions uh, we're just not very far away from March Madness and determining who's going to be the basketball champions. We're, this is the time of season that we just think about champions. But today, I really want to talk about a champion for God, how to be a champion for God, and how to have strength to stand in order to do that. Um, you know, the Bible is full of some great champions, uh, of course, we read about David and Goliath. We read about Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, we read about Elijah on Mount Carmel. But you know, there are a lot of champions for God that really in our own society go very much unnoticed. I uh, read periodically uh, from uh, articles in Global Christian Relief magazine. And uh, I also subscribe to Voice of the Martyrs. And it's amazing how many champions of, for God are going through great persecution in our day and our time. Just a few months ago, I want to read you a true story just, just a, by way of introduction. But just a few months ago, an angry mob of 50 to 60 town folks, village leaders, and even family members in a third world country, marched to the home of a man in their community incensed by what he had done. What had he done? He had simply done what these young ladies professed this morning in baptism, what many of you have professed. He had simply trusted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And they were going to make him pay for his decision. That day they attacked this man, his name is Jashem Uden, outside his home in Bangladesh, bent on forcing him to renounce his faith in Jesus and return to their religion of Islam. And Jashem would not give in. He said, I have received Jesus Christ in my life as my personal Savior and Lord. I have the right to choose and practice my faith. You cannot force me to do what you do. I will not renounce and forsake my faith in Jesus Christ. Jason's response and refusal angered the mob even more 
as they stabbed him and viciously beat him. Some in the crowd grabbed onto his hands and legs so that he could not escape, while others strangled him. And although some reportedly saw the attack, no one dared to try to stop it, fearing they could be next. Miraculously, Jashem managed to escape from his attackers. He went straight to his church. He went straight to his church leader's home where he showed his wounds and told them about the attack on both his body and his faith. And then they transported him to a hospital. A few days later, after his release, the police showed up at Jashem's home to take a report. But they realized the reason for the attack, instead of taking the report after they heard why he was attacked, the police ridiculed Jashem and denied him and his family any protection. The police officer's response emboldened the mob. They returned to him again to attack him. This time, they left him for dead. Desperately clinging to life, Jashem was admitted to the hospital a second time with severe injuries. Currently, he's still hospitalized, hospitalized in Bangladesh in poor condition. He's speaking incoherently. His wife and children have gone into hiding, and the mob has threatened to kill Jashem and his family if they return home. So pray for Jashem. Pray for his family. What would you do if you were faced in a situation, if you were put in a situation where it was demanded that you renounce your faith in Jesus? If your life was at stake, would you have strength to stand? Or better yet, if you have an opportunity to be a witness for the Lord, to say something positive about your relationship with Jesus Christ, to let your light shine when your life is not threatened, in school or at work, on the ball field, in the grocery store, at the bank, wherever you may be, when you have those opportunities to let your light shine, would you have strength to stand? In an obscure passage in the Bible that we're going to look at in a few moments, in 1 Kings chapter 22, there is a story about another champion for God. And church, I just want you to listen to the background of this story before we actually read our text this morning. But it's about a prophet. You may, have, may not have ever heard his name. His name is Micaiah. And Micaiah was a prophet of God. And he is going, I think if we look at his life carefully, teach us that a champion for God can stand and will have strength to stand. Let me give you this background behind his story. It happened about 900 years before Jesus was born. Israel had been a unified nation, but had recently split into two separate nations. Judah to the south, who had a king by the name of Jehoshaphat, and Israel, the northern kingdom, who had a king by the name of Ahab. Now just remember those two names. Jehoshaphat, king of the south, southern part of Israel. Ahab, the king of northern Israel. The story really begins whenever Ahab wanted to buy a vineyard that was right next to his palace. It was a vineyard by, that was owned by a man named Naboth. And he went to Naboth to see if he could purchase that vineyard that he really wanted. And Naboth told the king, says, I'm not ready to sell. I don't want to sell my vineyard. It was my father's and it was my grandfather's and my great-grandfather's. This has been in my family and I, I don't want to sell it. And Ahab was a wicked king, but he was also a very immature king. And the Bible tells us, if you have time to read the whole story, that Ahab 
pouted, was angry, went to his bedroom, got in his bed, and just stayed there pouting like a brat that he was. Ahab had a wicked wife by the name of Jezebel. And Jezebel came into his room and said, Ahab, what are you doing laying in the bed? And I can just hear Ahab saying, I wanted to buy Naboth's vineyard and he wouldn't sell it to me. And, and just pouted. And Jezebel says, what's wrong with you? You're a king. You can just, you can, I'll tell you what, Ahab, I'll take care of it. So Jezebel, she hires two guys at a, to attend a, a banquet, a dinner where Naboth was at. And she hired those two guys to make an accusation that Naboth had blasphemed God. Well, back then, all you needed was two or more witnesses to establish an accusation. And so these two people who were hired by Jezebel, her gangsters, if you will, made this accusation. They took Naboth out. They took him to the side of the palace wall and they stoned him to death. Well, God, God is not going to, uh, he's not going to allow that to happen without his attention. So God sent a prophet by the name of Elijah to Ahab. And Elijah found Ahab in all places in Naboth's vineyard. And he said to Ahab, God sent me to tell you that you're not going to get away with murder and with robbery. And Ahab just as the dogs, which they did, the Bible says when they stoned Naboth, the dogs came and licked his blood. And Elijah said to Ahab, just as the dogs licked the blood of Naboth, Ahab, the dogs are going to lick your blood as well. And in addition to that, they're the dogs are going to eat the flesh of Jezebel, your wife. So Elijah pronounced the judgment of God on Ahab. Well, years went by. Nothing happened to Ahab. Nothing happened to Jezebel. And they probably were thinking Elijah's prophecy will never come to pass. Well, that brings us a little closer to the story I want to share with you this morning. Because after years had passed, Ahab decided that he wanted to attack Syria and the Syrians. But he was afraid that his army of the northern kingdom was not enough power to overcome the Syrians. So he called, you remember Jehoshaphat, the king of the southern part of Israel? He called Jehoshaphat. Well, he didn't call him. He sent a messenger. And he said, listen, I think we need to attack the Syrians. Will you and your army help me? And Jehoshaphat said, well, I don't. And Jehoshaphat was a little more in tune with God than Ahab was. And Jehoshaphat says, well, I, I don't want to attack the Syrians unless I know God is going to be on our side. Ahab said, don't worry about that, Jehoshaphat. I have 400 prophets of God in my palace. Every one of them said it would be okay to attack the Syrians, that we would have victory. Problem was, those 400 prophets of God were on King Ahab's payroll. And they were just sort of like yes men. Jehoshaphat said, isn't there someone else that really is a prophet of God that we can hear from God? And Ahab said, yes, there's one other guy 
His name is Micaiah. But I really don't want to talk to Micaiah because every time he prophesies, it's always something negative. It's always something bad about me or about our kingdom. So I haven't consulted him. Jehoshaphat says, well, I I want to hear from him. So King Ahab says, okay, we'll hear what Micaiah has to say. And he summoned for Micaiah. Now the 400 prophets of Ahab are standing there. And Micaiah is standing there. Now I'm paraphrasing this, but folks, I'm telling you, you can read the story in 1 Kings. But that brings us to our text today. So if you would, look with me in 1 Kings chapter 22. That's the background. Micaiah's there. And this is what it says. The king said to him, I'm in verse, uh, we'll start, well, I tell you what, we'll start with uh, verse 14. But Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I will speak. Now let me pause right there. When they first asked Micaiah, Micaiah, will we have victory if we go to battle with the Syrians? Well, Micaiah, had, he knew what those 400 prophets had said. They had given the green light. So he sort of sarcastically said, yeah, just go ahead. You'll have victory. And Ahab knew he was being sarcastic, so he made him take an oath. And he says, I want you to swear to me that you're going to tell me whatever God says. And so that's when Micaiah got serious. And he says in verse 15, When he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth-Gilead to battle or shall we refrain? And he answered him, go up and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. That's what he said sarcastically. But the king said in verse 16, how many times shall I make you swear that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? And so Micaiah said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as, the, as sheep that have no shepherd. And then if you went on to read, Micaiah goes on to talk about and describe the carnage and the destruction that was going to occur if Ahab and Jehoshaphat went into battle with the Syrians. But now look, if you will, in verse 23 of that chapter. This is what Micaiah said. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. Now, that's that's what God said. One man against 400 prophets. And he's saying the Lord has declared disaster for you. But then in verse 24, it says, Zedekiah, he was sort of the head of those 400 prophets, the son of Chenaah, came near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, how did the Spirit of the Lord go from me to speak to you? Sort of sarcastically. In verse 25, Micaiah said, behold, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide yourself. In other words, when you're crawled under the bed, hiding under your bed, Uh, hiding from the attack of the Syrians, then you'll know how the Lord came to me. Verse 26, And the king of Israel said, Seize Micaiah, take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him meager rations of bread and water until I come in peace. And Micaiah said, If you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, hear all ye peoples. And some paraphrases and translations interpret that. Mark my words. You're not going to have victory. Well, the rest of the story is this. 400 to 1. For whatever reason, Ahab and Jehoshaphat went into battle anyway against the Syrians. However, Ahab 
he must have he must have in his mind and in his heart thought, you know, this Micaiah guy, I don't like him. He's always negative, but there may be a little bit of truth to what he said. So you know what Ahab did? He dressed like one of the soldiers when they went into battle. He didn't dress like a king because he knew the Syrians would be targeting the king. And so he just pretended he was one of the soldiers when they went into battle, hoping he wouldn't be recognized. But in the heat of the battle, a Syrian soldier took an arrow and just shot it, didn't aim, just shot it aimlessly into the sky towards the Israeli army. That arrow flew and found a chink in the armor between two plates of armor in Ahab's body. Ahab realized he was mortally wounded. He was dying. He told his chariot driver, he says, take me to the edge of the battlefield that I may watch the battle. And as his blood flowed into that chariot, Ahab laid there watching his army be decimated and destroyed by the Syrian army, just as Micaiah had prophesied. They carried Ahab back to his palace. They parked the chariot, carried Ahab inside where he died. And while he was dying, The dogs, the Bible says, came and licked the blood from his chariot, just as Elijah had prophesied. A little while later, a mob of people threw Jezebel off the walls. And when she landed, she died and was crushed. And they left her laying there. And the dogs came and ate her flesh just as Elijah had prophesied. Puritan preachers used to have a saying, the wills of God's justice grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. R.G. Lee took that text and preached a great message one day called Payday Someday. There's always accountability for our actions. But what about this prophet, Micaiah? Just three quick things I want to draw to your attention about standing as a champion. Because as our story ends, Micaiah is still in prison. He's on a bread and water diet. Ahab is dead. But Micaiah is a champion who wasn't afraid to stand alone, to speak God's truth when it was totally unpopular. The first thing I want to say about standing for God is stand up because a real champion for God can go against the crowd and can speak the truth. 400 prophets were saying, go into battle. Micaiah was saying, don't go. God's will is for you not to go. He was, it was one against 400. He had to go against the crowd. Today, we call it peer pressure. Have you ever experienced peer pressure? you ever known a child, a teenager, or in many cases, some adults, who just go along to get along because of the influence of the crowd, because of what the world is saying? You know, peer pressure... I've seen peer pressure influence a lot of people who had a lot of great potential to make some pretty dumb mistakes that had lifelong consequences. Whether it was drugs or alcohol or sexual immorality or stealing or attitudes or You know, peer pressure is a powerful force. You know, one of the first true reality TV shows was a show back in the late 1950s and mostly during the 1960s. 
Now, you young people and teenagers, y'all are not familiar with this name. But if I were to say, now I want you to listen to some of the, old, the adults. I'm not going to say just older, but, but some of the older adults in this room. If I say this name and say this phrase, I want you to listen to their response because this television show was extremely popular. If I were to say the name Alan Funt, and then if I were to say smile, did you hear them? There was a show called Candid Camera. It was one of the first television reality shows. And what they would do is they would take people and they would hide a camera. They would have a hidden camera. And they would put people in comical situations. But did you know that some of the episodes became case studies for sociologists researching peer pressure? I mean, in one of their episodes... There was a, uh, they had some of the actors, some of the paid actors get on an elevator. And those actors were facing, when they got on the elevator, they were facing the back wall. Now, it wasn't one of those elevators that had two doors, you know, one in the front. one. It was just one door and then a wall. And when people got onto the elevator, instead of turning around facing the door like most people do, they all got on, turned around and faced the back wall. And they wanted to see as people got onto that elevator what their reaction, whether they would be influenced by what everybody else was doing. In fact, let me show it to you. Russell, let's just show this. You'll enjoy this. Let's turn it up some, please. That's just an illustration of how influential peer pressure can be to cause you to conform. Now, sometimes it's good to go along, to conform. But sometimes, and we know in our heart through the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, and even through our conscience, when it's not good. Jerry Vines used to be the pastor at First Baptist Church, Jacksonville, Florida, and one of my favorite preachers, by the way. And uh, he told a story in one of his sermons about a high school girl in his church's youth group. It's a large church, First Baptist Jacksonville. And he had a young lady in his youth group who really 
wanted to be a cheerleader for their local high school. She had been practicing, and that was a dream of hers to be a cheerleader, and she was good. She was good as a cheerleader. And he said when the day came for the cheerleader tryouts that, uh, that she was trying out and going through the routine, and one of the judges of this, it was in a public school, but one of the judges that was making the determination held up a sign while she was doing her routine and it said if you like sex if you like to have sex smile and can you imagine the pressure for that and the influence of just something like that well she didn't smile as a matter of fact she stopped and she said if it takes compromising who I am and my convictions to be a cheerleader I won't. And she walked away. She didn't get selected, of course. Jerry Vine said she'll be a cheerleader for Jesus in glory one day. See, it takes strength to stand. It takes strength to stand in our society and in our culture. Ephesians chapter 4, let me read this to you. In verse 14 says this. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way to him who is the head in Christ. There's a balance here. You know, some people, they speak the truth, but they use it like a hammer just to hurt other people. Oh, the truth hurts, and I'm going to tell you the truth. And, and man, they just rub it in like salt in a wound. There is a place to speak truth, but the Bible says speak the truth in love. But speak the truth. Just do it with the right attitude, with the right spirit, with the right motive, with the right intent. On the other hand, there are some people where they're so sensitive um, they're so, they think so loving that they never speak the truth to someone about dangerous behavior, about things they see in their life that perhaps that person doesn't see. And so they just tolerate it and put up with it, assuming that they're doing the loving thing whenever that person may need some direction, may need some truth spoken to their heart, but spoken in love. And there may be times where you're the only one. So the first principle that we learn from Micaiah is stand up. Now the, the other two are very much more quick. The second is stand alone. You see, a champion needs a team, but sometimes but can stand alone if necessary. In Ephesians chapter uh, 6 and verse 13, I want you to listen to 13 and 14 of Ephesians 6. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Do you hear the word stand? Sometimes we have to stand alone. I love that song we sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Like Micaiah, you must be willing to stand up and to speak God's truth in love. You must be willing to stand alone. But now listen, if you are willing to stand up and you're willing to stand alone, you must stand strong. You see, a champion who speaks the truth can expect to be attacked. It is true sometimes that truth hurts, but sometimes the truth not only hurts the person or people that you may be speaking it to, Sometimes the truth can hurt you and you must be willing to suffer just like Jason in the story that I shared with you in Bangladesh. Jesus said this in John 15. 
And, and you need to realize this if you're going to stand strong. Jesus said in verse 18 of John 15, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. <clears throat> but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Jesus said, just like the world hated me, they're going to hate you. So as believers, when you stand up and you say, you know what? When we're born, we're either born a boy or a girl. There are people who will attack you for saying that. Whenever... We stand up and say marriage is holy. It's a holy matrimony between a man and a woman. In the eyes of God, that is the only blessed marriage there is. People will attack you for that. You must be willing to stand. You must be willing to stand alone. You must be willing to stand strong. Whenever you go, young people, you go to college and they start teaching you that we came from some amoeba or some cell or some cosmic explosion. And there's no such thing as creation, but we're all the products of evolution. Are you going to let that compromise your convictions on the word of God that says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth? We must be willing to stand up, to stand alone, and to stand strong. But there are times that we need to stand together. That's why church is so important. That's why having the camaraderie and the encouragement and the support of a small group, Sunday school, connect group, a men's group, a ladies group, a Bible study group, a church family. It's because God has given to us each other to be an encouragement, to stand together so that we can stand strong. And when the day comes when we have to stand alone, at least we know that there are others that have stood alone beside us, with us, and before us. May God give us strength to stand. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this word from your word. And I do pray that we would be people who are not standing in our own wisdom, are not standing on our own ideas. But we are standing on absolute truth that is only found in your word. And I pray today that if there's someone here in this room that has not put their faith in you, Lord, that they would realize that they do not have a solid rock to stand on. Lord, that they're standing on sinking sand. But today, Lord, remind them that you said you are the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through you. And may this be the day they put their foot, spiritually speaking, on the solid rock. May this be the day they trust you as their Lord and Savior. And if they have, I pray that you would help them to be obedient and follow you in believers' baptism if they've never made that decision. And if they have, Lord, I pray that you'd give to all of us opportunities to know that through your Holy Spirit, you provide for us, just like you did Micaiah, strength to stand. Lord, help us to never fall for that which we should be standing for. So bless this invitation, I pray in Christ's name. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. I'll be here at the front to receive you. If God has spoken to your heart and you feel you'd like to come and just kneel here at the altar or speak to me about a decision, uh, we'll pray with you and encourage you. I want to give you that opportunity. Let's stand together as we sing. Are you hurting and broken?
this morning and I actually did not finish my message today because I really want to put the truth into your heart that just like there's a payday someday for those who disobey God there is a payday someday for those who trust God and one of these days it may be eternity before we realize our full reward but God blesses those that stand for him that serve him and one of these days in eternity you'll look back and never ever regret even though you may have been in the minority standing for Jesus so stand strong church in every opportunity that God gives us well it's been a good day of worship thank you for coming if you've not yet worshiped the Lord with your tithes and your offerings we have our offering boxes in the back of this room and one out in the vestibule in the four-year area and so I just want to encourage you church family um, to be faithful throughout this year the Bible says the tithe is holy unto the Lord in other words that it's the Lord's it belongs to him so be faithful in bringing your tithes and offerings as you come to worship the Lord that's part of our worship and um, so I want to encourage you to do that because it's not that I'm trying to get something from you or the church is trying to get something from you. I'm trying to give something to you. That puts you in a position for God to bless. And I want you to be a blessed church. God said, see if I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive. So be faithful throughout the year and God bless you as you do. All right, Brother Jacob, Brother John, any final word before we dismiss? Um, Okay, we have our Wednesday night connect groups on Wednesday night. And uh, next Sunday morning will be another wonderful day. Hope you'll come and be a part of it. Uh, we're going to have a super, super Sunday morning on Super Bowl day. So you come and be a part of church that day. And thank you guests that have come to join us. I know we had family and friends of those that were baptized. I know it was a blessing to them for you to be here. So God bless you for sharing in that with them. All right, uh, what's our song? Of, what, what are we singing? I'm standing on the solid rock. Oh, well, I think we just need to, uh, I tell you, why don't we just hear the first verse and chorus of this because you'll be blessed by this song, Standing on the Solid Rock. You'll be blessed by our praise team. After the first verse and chorus, you can be dismissed. Through my disappointment, strife and discontentment, I cast my every care.